finding recovery at least gave me a place where I was like, I do not belong here. This is how I find my identity, how I like feel secure with myself. Being able to share with other people and then hearing, even when I hear like, oh no, I can't relate with that, but you're able to hold space for what I just said. Okay, you hear me and you see me. If you're willing to hold that space for me, then I feel safe. And mm -hmm. that is how I think I find my identity is that safety. Stories are powerful. powerful. Welcome to the Rise, Recover, Live podcast brought to you by The Phoenix. This is a space where people impacted by substance use can come to share their story of strength and resilience, get open and honest, and inspire hope and build community through shared experience. We'll be talking to people in our community on their own recovery journey and shine a light on the topic of recovery in all its forms. Maybe you'll hear some of your story in theirs. Let's show the world that together we rise, recover, and live. Welcome, everybody, to yet another episode of the Rise Recovery Live podcast. We are your hosts, Bryce the Third. He, him pronouns. <laughs> Liz McKean, she, her pronouns. Yeah, you see what I did there. I kind of like put a little bit of good energy into yet another. It's still my radio voice, but I didn't want to like, you know, because last time you was like, yet another. Like, I'm, you know, so I just wanted to give it some, some, some energy, some, put some syrup on it, you know? It was beautiful. Well, yeah, there's a difference between like yet another or like yet another. <laughs> <laughs> We're going it's for the just, first one. <laughs> it's just a fine line. Uh, you I can know. cross that line at any time. How's your energy, Liz? Um, my energy is elevated. I am feeling energetic. It's been a busy day, lots of talking. And like I said, before we hit record, this is, I've, I've done a lot of talking today. Um, but this is the talk that I've been the most excited about because I'm in this little virtual room with two of my very favorite people in the whole wide world. So how about wow. you? How's your energy? I am. I'm pretty good. I mean, uh, like I was telling our guests before we started rolling, I had a show last night and I was really feeling kind of, I was experiencing some lowness yesterday. Mm. And uh, especially in the realm of that show, like I just, I don't know, I didn't have, I didn't have juice. Mm. Um, but I ended up playing a little bit of tennis. I, I was getting to the tennis racket for Sweetest Day. Um, so I played some tennis. And then when it came to the show, like I just, I built a community and a, a craft in such a way that I can get on stage and like say, hey guys, I'm experiencing lowness today. And mm. this is what we're going to talk about. And this is how I'm going to use my art. And this is the community that we're going to build tonight. And so it was cathartic. People had a great time. It was dope. And I think I'm better for it today. So that's that. And I'm awesome. excited for this conversation because uh, just a little bit of um, precursor. There's always like the guests that, I don't know, just energetically, I can feel like this is about to be a great conversation, you, you know? Um, and Mika is somebody that like I've had the opportunity to work with a bit, um, meet in person and connect with a bit. But I'm, I'm super excited to go in depth uh, into her story. So Liz... Who's Mika? I was just mentioning Mika's name. <laughs> Who's Mika? <laughs> well, Mika Mummy is, gosh, you know, one of my favorite people. I think that's the best way to introduce her. She is part of the Phoenix family. I think similar to me, like, you know, started as a member, then a volunteer, and now works for the Phoenix. I mean, pretty much makes just the wind beneath the wings of all of everything that happens in Denver. Yeah, everything I've ever been part of that Mika's been part of, whether it's a big old project with the Phoenix or just like a little conversation about our day is I, I'm better for it and the project, the conversation, all the things. So thank you for being here to make us better, Mika, by your wonderful presence and welcome. How are you? Hi, I'm good. I am so thankful that you guys uh, offered this opportunity, like you said, like I, I've just been, I've been a little like anxious all day. I think I've learned the difference between like my nerves and anxious. So I guess I should say I've been nervous, like a little mm. nervous, but because I'm excited. So I think <laughs> I know the difference now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Just excited yeah. to talk to you guys. They're, they're like one and the same for real, like nerves and excitement. Yeah just are like one and the same. And so like learning to, yes, reframe, but also sit with it in such a way that is compassionate to us in our process. And 
you know, uh, not suppressing the feeling, but, you know, knowing that, at least for me, that's been the guiding compass to the things that I know that I can contribute the most to. Because, like, if I didn't if I didn't care, like, I wouldn't even feel nothing, <laughs> you, you know? So, like, mm-hmm. you're the best person to have this conversation with because you feel something. I, you know, I was in a yoga class the other day, and the teacher said, you know, I, I teach yoga, and I often, you know, remind people if something is hurting you, you know, to, like, trust your body to tell you, like, this it's okay if this pose isn't for you. It's not something wrong with you. It's just the pose isn't, isn't your jam today, and that's fine. Um, but she said, you know, if a pose either has if you're if you're experiencing no sensation or if you know the sensation is pain then it's not for you and of course i had to like write that down and think about how that could be a metaphor for like all the other things and that's like exactly what you just said if there's nothing this or if there's you know if it hurts like those are good indicators and i mean yeah it's, it could only it's be that interesting simple. using using like the yoga metaphor because with me and yoga, I'm like, no, damn it. I'm going to get into this pose because they're over there and they're in this pose. I can do it. Even you know? if it hurts. And that's, <laughs> especially if it hurts. I know. Bryce's leg is behind his head right now as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you know, that's an indication of being able to show up for yourself um, and what it is that you need uh, uh, aside from, I think, comparison, seeing what other people are able to do or are not able to do is... It can be the thief of joy, but it, it can also be that reference point. Once we have reference yeah. points, it, it allows for us to see ourselves maybe even more if we use that as that that indicator of what it is that we can do or not, you know? Um, but in the realm of knowing ourselves, it's just like a daily practice. Like, how can I show up and, and, and be allowing for what it is that I need or I don't need today? And I, I think with that being said, like like Mika, um, like who are you? <laughs> <laughs> what a loaded question. <laughs> we start simple. Yeah. Um, yeah. I am first and foremost uh, a person in recovery. Uh, she, her pronouns. Um, and I don't know why this just came to mind, but I feel the urge to say so. A strong black woman, as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I think. You know, yeah, offline, I've had conversations probably with Liz or other, at least other people uh, in the organization. I, I work for the Phoenix, obviously, I'm here. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm the Denver manager. I sometimes get, sometimes that still shocks me. Um, and I think I, I try to say my own title and I'm like, no, you are the program manager. But yeah, I uh, am a person in recovery. I am a Black woman. I say that now with enthusiasm because so much of my recovery and my journey has been figuring out who I am uh, mm. and my identity. Uh, who, yeah, well, who is Nika? <laughs> like, you know, I like mm. to do, how do I identify heart, mind, spirit? Yeah, I, I was born and raised, uh, well, born in Denver, raised in Fort Collins, Colorado. Um, I'm adopted, huge part of my story, and has been like this pinpoint to the like identity struggles. I think that I didn't really realize for a really long time that that was something that I was struggling with is my identity uh, until I got sober and was like, oh, wow, I get this opportunity to look back at my life and also where I want to go and where I, you know, and merge them together um, and figure out who I am. Yeah, I've been, my sobriety date is January 5th, uh, 2019. So coming up on five years, which is insane. (laughs) Absolutely insane. Um, Doesn't it feel like forever and also no time at all at the exact same time and nothing in between? Oh my gosh, yeah. Yeah. So this past week, um, I went on a trip with my sponsor. Um, We went to this fitness festival and we got to share a room and like we had this moment of like, she was like, oh, you're coming up on five years? And I was like, yeah. She's coming up on, I think, seven. And I'm like, what is happening? Where's the time gone? But I feel like, feel like such a baby sometimes in the recovery journey. So it's fine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A baby feeling. So to hear somebody heard you say your sobriety date and they're like, oh, it can be done. Mm-hmm. And oh, like this person, like I can relate to this person and it can be done for me. And I think that's the importance of like, the the years and like saying the years, but at at ten, like my sponsee is about to get five years this week. As a matter of fact, I got ten years, and 
it's baby time. Like, I really feel like I've just set the foundation for, like, understanding me, <laughs> you, you know? And then tomorrow you ask me, like, who are you? I'll be like, I don't even know, man. <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, but I think it's a beautiful thing to be able to be a part of the process of learning new things about ourselves, journeying in a way that we never have before, but also being able to take a look back and integrate the experience that we've had thus far into who it is that we are today, which is what I kind of hear you sharing that you've had the luxury to be able to do. And super excited to like dig into that, what, what that journey has looked like for you, especially as somebody who's adopted and you know, learning how to find where you fit and where you belong in life. Uh, how does that play a role into your recovery? Yeah, I mean, that immediately brings up this like topic that I think has been the topic of every therapy like session that I've had since I got sober. But it's like, I feel like I tie my my worth and like to, you know, the things that I do. And so when I got sober, I was like, I didn't feel like I was like worth anything. I'm like, I don't know who I am. Like, I can't be worth anything to anyone, you know? And I think that, like, my sobriety has shown me that, like, I am worthy just because I am. And I can, like, dive deeper into that and just, I mean, the, like, uh, metaphor or whatever that everyone uses, maybe in 12-step language, is, like, pe the peeling of the onion, right? <laughs> like, you peel back these layers of the onion and you find more. Um, and I think that's just been... That's been my story in in recovery, um, in sobriety, whether it's like work or personal story has just been this like discovering of who I am, that I'm still worthy just because I am and not because of the things I do or where I come from or whatever, just like as me, as I show up, I'm worthy. Mm. I love that so much. I, I've been dealing, not dealing, I guess working with is the a better word, with similar feelings of like, what does it mean to be worthy? Like, what is like, you know, who am I? And kind of trying to find a hierarchy of those identities, you know, when that's not even necessary. And I just kind of do that automatically. And, and I find that I do that with m moments too, like almost like pre, I, I was thinking about this, like I just mo recently moved back to Rochester where I'm from. And so I'm looking back at like before when I lived here and pictures and things like that, that I've kind of refused to like really look at or acknowledge for a long time because that was pre-sobriety. And so like, that was like, non Liz, like as if those, mm -hmm. but those moments mattered too. You know what I mean? Like even like versions of me that being worthy, not just even this one and that layers that speaks to me too, because it's like each layer, you're, the, the goal, I mean, eventually there's just no more onion, right? Like the goal isn't to like find the onion, like it's all the onion mm -hmm. and it's each, each layer, like you just peel one, there's, there's another one there. So like be on the one you're at, enjoy that stinky onion layer, you know, like it's, it's there, it's there now, like be in it. So I don't know, is that like, what layer are you in right now? Like, where are you, what, what's, what's life and recovery look like for you in this moment? Yeah, I think where I'm at right now, I think I'm, I've like entered in the, into this chapter in the past couple of weeks, I've just felt like this kind of like stirring, I don't know, mm. in me. And so I just have felt like I'm like, walking into a new chapter and I'm a little like fearful, a little apprehensive, a little like, because even though I know who I am, sometimes I still feel that like, okay, like what's next? Where are we going? You know? And I feel like that at work a little bit right now, but I also feel like that in my personal life, like I literally on Friday, Friday evening, like very late Friday evening, got a message from a woman who had been helping me. She's helped me over the past couple of years find my birth family. She sent me this message. I reached out to her briefly. She sent me this message um, and said, oh my gosh, I missed this little bit of a conversation. I think I know who your birth father is. Mm -hmm. And sent me like an email and a Facebook. And I previously had thought, um, and it is yet to be, I guess I can't say with 100% certainty that this person is my birth father yet, but it was like the door open to this like new, new chapter of my life because that's like a knowing that I haven't had, you know? And so mm -hmm. um, I don't know if the stirring was like my body, I don't know, the universe telling me this thing was coming, but I got to send an email and a Facebook message. And so I'm kind of in this period of like waiting which could be really uncomfortable. But I also think like I've learned so much in 
recovery, about understanding like peace and understanding it, like just acceptance in general. And so, yeah, I think I'm just in this like, okay, do I get a response or do I not? And either is fine. Yeah, I, I feel like not to be like super biased, but like people in recovery like are the best people. <laughs> I, think like I could I couldn't imagine being a person without like the tools of intentional like peace generation or like allowance that comes with that work on self that it's inherent in recovery in a circumstance like that. Yeah. Like the, there has been times where I have, you know, I put in an application for the, the house that I'm in right now and I didn't know where I was going to get it. But like I was living in a place where I had a squirrel in the ceiling and it was eating my walls and it would pop his head out. Like I got to get the fuck out of here. <laughs> and so like this application had to go through and I, I couldn't sleep for like two or three nights and it was like, this is in like active recovery. And it's like, I want something so bad. And like, that was a process that taught me, like I had to have that experience and feel that feeling to, to learn the tools that allow for me to show up in like high stress situations and, and allow and let go. Yeah. But then I'm sure there'll be something else where like it pops up and then I have to learn as who I am now, how to show up and allow and let go because I prioritize my peace versus an outcome. And like to hear you share about what some may consider to be like a, a high stakes situation or something like it has to go a certain type of way with a certain like serenity in your voice. It just, I think it's indicative of the work that you've done on yourself. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's definitely been, I mean, I'm not always like this. I will say that. <laughs> but it was funny. I was in a, a meeting the other night. We were talking about, I work a 12-step program. So we were talking about the ninth step promises, which are uh, in the big book. And so talking about like, you know, will no peace, uh, serenity, and, you know, as one of those promises. And I was like, in my head, I'm like, but it doesn't say we'll always humble <laughs> peace and serenity. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think that like the uncertainty of like, you're not always going to feel peaceful or have serenity or be in acceptance, but you can always obtain it, I think is like the peace that I needed to connect in that meeting. It's like, it's not given. I won't be peaceful. You know, I'm sure Trev uh, <laughs> will tell him I'm not always peaceful, my coworker. Like that I can come to that if I want it. And you believe in it, yeah. like, no, like, I feel like knowing peace and being, you know, feeling it mm -hmm. are two different things, but like, you can't ever like really be or feel it if you don't know it. It's like that for me, that just sounds like faith, you know, like I, I know that it exists and I know that, you know, even if it's not here in this moment, like I have the capacity to find it. I mean, we, we've been talking lately, Bryce and I on the podcast about, how much we love, um, I mean, all of our guests, but like folks that have come on and talked about, you know, I've been, I think some of the language they've used is like sober for X amount of years, but, you know, in recovery around the recovery journey for X plus amount of years and like how like, you know, all that time matters and like, and that is recovery because, you know, even during the times that it's like, crap, like I, I, I how do I get here again, you know? There's still like, but you know that it's there. You know it's possible. You've seen it. You felt it. And you, you know, sometimes you just have to see it in other people that know it, it's possible. But like, that's the thing that gets me through is like, there's going to be really crappy moments. Like, what do you say, Bryce? Like, life, life be life. And, <laughs> and <laughs> it's, but, well, life be life. And, but like, I, but the reason I can get through those moments where it's just like everything, you know, my body's in high alert anxiety and just thinks, thinks, seem totally terrible. Like, it's like, okay, but I know this moment won't always feel this way. And that is the only reason that it's survivable. Yeah. So that's knowing it. I don't know. I don't think I had, I don't think I knew uh, peace in active addiction or active use, you know? And so like, I was thinking about that the other night, how like, even though I don't have it all the time now uh, in recovery, like, at least I know it. At least I know how to go find it. Mm -hmm. I just, you know, what a massive change that is um, from just mm -hmm. absolute chaos all the time. <laughs> and, 
Uh, and just feeling that and not even just like chaos around me, but like internal chaos, just feeling mm. like turbulent. Yeah. Yeah. The, one of the biggest promises delivered to me through my program is being able to show up for life on life's terms uh, because it's just a settling in my spirit that like no matter what this is, because even so and, and like speaking on what we spoke on to begin with, like where did the time go? But we've also talked on the show about like the 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 luxury of time, you know, uh, the the luxury of hindsight. It's like when you're first here and, you know, you're nine hours sober, you're nine hours in, 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 into intentional living and you don't really have anything personal to be able to draw inspiration from or like pull as a reference point. And you got to use other people's experiences to like, OK, they say I can do it. I mean, I need something different than what I've been doing. So I'm going to just go with what they saying. But like five years in, I'm sure you've had some experiences that allow for you, like if you were to have an experience today that might even be novel and new, you still have like experiences that you could pull off of. Well, I did that and I got through that or, you know, I had that experience and I was able to find strength in that. Like that luxury of hindsight, I think, is one of the, the more beautiful things about time spent intentionally showing up for ourselves. Totally. Yeah, I think. I'm able to sit with this like uncertainty as my birth father and where, what door that's going to open because I have actually like been through this before, uh, weirdly enough. <laughs> uh, like three years ago now, talk about where the time has gone. Like, I can't believe it's been three years. How, how, how so? Like we're the same, in the same circumstance? Yeah. So I... We're the same person? Yeah. Or? Not same person, um, but so I was adopted, super young age, a couple weeks old. Born in Denver, grew up in Fort Collins. So my parents, um, I'll call them my adoptive parents, even though that's not how I like refer to them. It's just easier because <laughs> it gets all a little messy. For clarity, uh, <laughs> for yeah. Um, but yeah, they uh, were professors in um, at CSU or uh, college in Fort Collins, and so that's where I grew up. And it was a closed adoption, um, and so up until I was eighteen, I was legally like not allowed to look for, ask questions, try to find uh, my birth parents, but I knew I was adopted. Um, both of my adopted parents are white. It was pretty cut and dry <laughs> at that point. I didn't look anything like them. Um, but that, you know, I was talking about identity, um, stuff like that created some, some identity uh, crisis for me that I think I didn't realize um, until I got older. But a couple years into recovery, I, this was like, now, this was during the pandemic. My stepmom gave me a 23andMe DNA test. Um, mm. And so I took it. So I'm like, you know what? Like, my therapist is like, when is the time going to be right? That you're going to like, and the time is never right. You know, like mm. I'm, I just got to go kind of rip the bandaid off sometimes. Um, and so submitted that. Unsure about how, you know, what kind of results I was going to get. Um, and you kind of prepare yourself, or at least I did, for all of the scenarios that could possibly happen, right? Like, am I going to ruin someone's life? Am, mm -hmm. am mm -hmm. I going to, is, am I going to be hurt, you know? Or is the answer going to be no? You know, all those things go through your head, like if I do find these people. Yeah, I got results back. And luckily, our uh, first cousin came up, which makes it a lot easier, not for myself, but for somebody who can understand how to build a family tree from nothing. <laughs> um, it was easy. So I, I found this woman um, on a Facebook group uh, that is for people who are looking for a DNA relative, um, and you can ask for help. And so basically, I gave her all of this information that I had. And within, I think it was like less than 48 hours, she sent me a Facebook message. It was like, I found your birth mother. Here's where she is. She's in the town over from you. And Holy here's God. her information. You have four siblings, four half siblings. And here you go. And I was like, Sheesh. Ooh, I put my phone down. I remember just like looking at that, seeing her photo, being like, yeah, for sure. Uh, mm -hmm. like my heart nail, put my phone down, went to the bathroom. It was like 6 a.m. <laughs> went to the bathroom and came back and was like, okay, where do I go from here? Like, yeah. you know, um, 
And so I ended up sending a email just asking, you know, if she wanted contact with me, because I strongly believed at that point that like, as I do still, that it's their choice as much as it is mine. And I've had a really great life. And so I'm not, you know, resentful, or at least I didn't think I was. We'll get better <laughs> um, in any way. But yeah, she responded really quickly. I remember like pulling off to the side of the road because I got this email back and she's like, yes, I am your birth mother. Yes, I would like to have contact with you. Um, and my heart just like that. I mean, my life changed forever in that moment. Um, and I drove to the Phoenix immediately. Like, I don't even think there was, I think it was open gym. And I don't even come to open gyms that much. I literally just drove here. And luckily there were a few of my friends and I was just like this crazy thing just happened. And I don't know what to do with the emotions or like how to handle it. And just got to like sit there and walk through it with them. Yeah. And I now have this incredible relationship with my birth mom and I know my siblings, but like that is why I'm able to like sit here and be like, okay, you've been here before. You can sit with the uncomfortable feeling or you can, mm. you can know that like whatever outcome it is, you'll have peace. And I think whether it is that answer, you know, yes, my birth father wants to have contact or not, you know, I'm good. I got community. Mm. I've got family. So long, long story <laughs> short. <laughs> Good story. No, thank you for sharing that. That I had like uh, several times, like goosebumps <laughs> down my arms. That was, that's incredible. And also the fact that when you had those big emotions and it was like, I don't know what to do with this. Like, these are heavy. Like I'm, you know, the, the answer was me go to the place where I know my friends, the people that love me are mm -hmm. who can help me hold them, you know, like I don't have to hold this all by myself. And that, I mean, in itself is huge. And like you did that and you, you built that and you formed those relationships. And also like you trusted people yeah. enough to share that with them. And I mean, and now you're trusting, you know, us and, and folks. And I just know that everyone who's listening is, you know, equally holding you up because that's like, I mean, that's got to be just, I would think just not just one wave of emotions. It's probably waves that continue to come in, in different ways over time. And yeah, I, I don't have a question. I just wanted to say thanks. Thank you for that beautiful story. You are. Yeah, we're going to have to, we definitely going to do like an update to see yeah. like what happens. Uh, <laughs> if, if you would like, uh, I'd be super excited to see what, like we're, we're buckled in for the journey now. Buckle up. The layers keep getting fields. <laughs> I'm curious, uh, probably selfishly, um, how, how you've been able to navigate the conversation of identity in your life. Like when it comes to, uh, being adopted, when it comes to being uh, a black woman raised by white parents, when it comes to being a black person living in Denver, mm -hmm. like I just found, like <laughs> I found a community where some black people was, but I've been to Denver like five or six times. And every time I've come, it's like, where are my people at? Like, There's not a lot of us uh, here. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm super curious to hear like how you've navigated that journey for yourself and, and how this unfolded. Yeah, I mean, I think to an extent, like I will forever be navigating it. I think like, why do I want to start there? I think from a really young age, we'll just we'll start there chronologically. It's good. <laughs> Once upon a time. <laughs> I'm little Mika. Uh, <laughs> oh, little Mika. Little Mika. I mean, I, I always knew that I, I looked different. I mean, if you've been to Denver and you see like how many Black people are here, go to Fort Collins. Uh, and it is exponentially smaller. Like the number oh, of snap. Um, it's a, definitely a predominantly white college town. Um, and so I grew up and I think I was maybe one of like a handful of black people that were maybe in around my age or even that I knew of in town. Um, so much so that I would get mistaken for this other girl. You know, I don't think we look anything alike. But, you know, that's kind of will tell you like a little bit of how how it felt growing up. Um, but I think I was always striving to fit in at some point, which also fueled my 
um, addiction later in life. Um, just wanting to like, not knowing who I was and so like wanting to find some way to fit in. So I gravitated towards sports because I was like, I can do that. And it not be this like, I don't know. It wasn't, we weren't looking at like race, race or um, your physical features. It was just like, can you score a goal? Great. Uh, <laughs> we're moving on. Um, mm. Yeah, it was hard. And I don't think I realized that until I got older um, and definitely didn't realize it until a few years ago when there was kind of this resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement. And I, in that time, was just so confused. Uh, I was feeling a lot of different emotions and like really unsure if I identified with Black culture uh, Mm. because I grew up in white culture, right? Or a different culture. Um, And so I felt for a long time, I also felt just really uncomfortable, like in a group of people that looked like me, uh, where I'm like, oh, they're going to (laughs) know. Like, they're going to know that I, like, I just felt like I I didn't fit in. It's like one foot in this group, one foot in that group, and just very alone. And so I think like, Finding recovery at least gave me a place where I was like, I do know I belong here. And then within that was able to find my birth family and my my brothers and sisters. Look, we look identical, like so much alike. And so I think for me, that was like a acceptance of who I am and what I look like and truly just starting to feel comfortable in my own skin. Mm. Yeah, for, for for those of y'all who may not know that these things exist, uh, there there can be like division within a black community sometimes. Um, I I I when I came up, like I always I got the oh you talk white, like how you talk a color, like because I was, my mom was big on grammar and like diction, so I couldn't like chop my words up or like come home saying no, that ain't the way I'm trying to. That ain't what what ain't ain't what you mean ain't that isn't. And I'm like, yes, mom, that isn't the way that I want to. <laughs> so then I go to school and then, you know, uh, it's, it, it can be sometimes like uh, hard just in general for us to find where we belong. <laughs> and, and, and then when you when you talk culturally and then you talk like circumstantial, like how your your life has been where it's like you have these different variables that that affect how it is that you activate within different culture uh, that can lead to a a, a complicated compass around like where do I belong and like who am I and I think the answers to those questions in the seasons of our lives allow for us to identify those groups of people where when we have those big emotions and we can run and it's like, okay, I know my people are here. <laughs> so, you know, I'm dealing with these emotions. I just got to talk to somebody. Like, these are my people. For, for those listening who may have not have participated in like the process of like discovering that, like that is a very real experience. And the navigation of it is something that I think just us talking out loud about may may create community (laughs) you're not alone because obviously there's other people navigating this in life trying to find their people oh yeah i feel like this this sort of conversation that we're having right now is like how i this is how i find my identity how i like feel secure with myself is by like being able to share with other people and then hearing even when i hear like oh no i can't relate with that but you're able to hold space for what i just said like that Mm -hmm. for me is like okay, you hear me and you see me. Um, and so you might not understand or, or resonate exactly with the same story that I'm telling or the things that I'm bringing up. But like, if you're willing to hold that space for me, then I feel safe. And mm-hmm. that is how I think I find my identity is that safety, that feeling of safety. And then what I think like happens too is now you can create a space for someone else mm-hmm. because like, you know what it feels like. So now you are equipped from your experience to be able to show up and and genuinely create a a safe and authentic space for somebody to to feel seen. 
Absolutely. It's been, it's wild too, because, you know, that happens so quickly. I think sometimes I, I forget that like the things that I go through sometimes aren't even like, they're so much bigger than me, right? It's not just for me, but like, and we learn this in recovery. I've learned this a lot, but it's so that I can pass that on to someone else, right? Like stick that hand out, say, I've been there. Do you want to hear like my experience? Um, It might be useful to you. And just create that safe space for them as well. And it happened so quickly. I told, I've told this story multiple times, you know, in the rooms of AA. And then had people come up after a meeting and say like, oh, I'm adopted. Also, like, I didn't even know that my home group, there were like five people that were adopted. (laughs) You know, and so like having them come up to me, you know, on the porch, uh, they're like smoking a cigarette. And they're like, I don't know. Like, I didn't know you were adopted. You know, I'm thinking of reaching out or finding this person. Like, what was your experience? I'm so nervous. And I'm like, yeah, I get that. Here's what I did. And like, you're going to be okay, no matter what. Like, if you have a community, you have people and you also have yourself. Like, you can trust, I don't know, I can trust myself in recovery. So yeah, it's it's really cool to watch that ripple effect. I think it was in um, Caleb's episode that we kind of discussed the whole concept of can you get sober for somebody else you know like and how you know he was like I wouldn't have taken that first step if it wasn't for you know my mom or something and and you know so so often we hear and and learn and say that you know you can't do this for anybody else you know you can only it's got to come from within for you all those things but sometimes that door is not going to open unless it is something external and I feel like that's identity kind of too it's like yes the ultimate goal is the wrong word but the ultimate I don't know it like just when this becomes really something that you can hold, like, like the, like knowing the peace, you know, like when you really know it, that's like really within you and you're able to go and do the scary things and know that you're okay because you're okay. Cause inherently you are okay and worthy. But sometimes it's like when you're not sure, you know, am I, am I okay? Like someone witnessed, someone really seeing you, someone looking and seeing Mika and like, just like all of you and like seeing, and then, then you seeing yourself be seen, like that's how it starts. And that just like cracks open the door. And then when you step through, yeah, then it is, then you are able to find ways to do it within yourself. But I think that's, it's so powerful and beautiful. And like, it's, it's one of the honestly things that I think social media occasionally can do is that it allows you to feel seen And that is the first step to seeing yourself. And like, yeah, and recovery has so many opportunities for that. Like, holy crap. Honestly, even if you're listening to this and you're still in, you know, active addiction and trying to freaking claw your way out, like we see you too, you know, like that's, there's just, you really, we really, all those little voices in ourselves that say that we're alone or we're the only one. And it's like, those are, those are not the real, those are not real. Those are lies. Lies. (laughs) <laughs> I know. Oh, if the lies of my brain will make up for. Oh my gosh! Just wild. No. <laughs> no. Speaking of things that our brains do, and I know we're we're coming up on time, but I want to just pivot us slightly, just because I've heard you speak about this before, and you do it beautifully, and I think it's powerful. Also, I love the way you framed this. We we always ask guests before if there's like areas that they kind of like would like to talk about, and th- Mika's exact words. I'm sorry, I'm just gonna quote you because it makes me laugh. <laughs> we're Discipline and routine, and then in parentheses, and the lack of, LOL. (laughs) 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 Which is the most relatable thing that I've ever heard or read in my entire life. So (laughs) tell us about that. What is that? What's discipline, routine, and the lack of look like for you? I say lack of. I I feel like I call myself out on this stuff all the time because like, I used to think that like people in recovery or somebody who was sober, like they did things so perfectly, right? And I still will tell myself that like, oh, my sponsor does these things so perfectly. And it's like, that's not, that's not true. Uh, None of us are perfect. And it's like this ebb and flow. And I found that, that like discipline and routine, like I am in a season where I'm really trying to hone in on discipline again, because um, I know that when I feel uncertain or I feel like a little, I don't know, something's moving around and I just don't know Mm -hmm. what it is that if I focus on my routine and something that I can be disciplined at or show discipline through, that like things start to calm down a little bit for me, um, that I find like safety again in that routine and in the discipline. And like when I got 
sober, I came to the Phoenix. Um, it was the second time I had gotten sober. Um, and I knew I needed something else. And so, you know, I started my 12 step program, which is very disciplined. You know, you, you go through this, like, uh, you know, you peel away at the onion and it's like, we've got 12 steps for you to follow. And so it's very, you know, disciplined and structured. And so in, I needed that for my mind, but I also needed like routine and discipline for my body. Um, and so coming in to the gym, it, it just became a habit. It was like, I go to work, I come to the gym. I felt like I get to see my community. I work out, which is also good for my mind. And then I go to a meeting and then I go home and I go to bed and I do it all over the next day. And it built this like foundation that I know I can fall back on whenever I feel a little rumbling or a little uncertainty. Like, I know that if I come back to that, that I'll start to just feel a little more even keel. And that's like a safety zone for me. And in this season, I just started this like new workout plan because I've been in just kind of an ups and up and down, you know, the past year, there's been so many like new things in my life, so many things going on. And so I'm like, okay, I got to find a little bit of discipline here. So you guys can hold me accountable. Listeners hold me accountable. I am starting this workout plan today. And it is 10 weeks until the end of the year, you know? And I'm like, okay, I can set that goal for myself. And I know looking back on my recovery that I can achieve those things, you know? When I've got community, when I hold myself accountable, like I've got this routine, it just makes me feel good. Yeah, just a little tool that I picked up that tends to work for me. In that description, I think like there's what is done for you, uh, why it's, important for you and how it helps usher your well-being and all of that good stuff. But like for us, uh, interesting folk that need to have a how-to, <laughs> how do you do it? Because uh, discipline, I've had to actually like had to like stay away from the word discipline. It's like, okay, I'm not, it's not being disciplined. I'm not, because discipline has like this connotation where it's like, ugh, for me. <laughs> but it's like, okay, but you, you're being a disciple of yourself. Like you're showing ah. up and you're 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 being a disciple of what it is that you you, you stated that you desire in life and the, and the lifestyle that you want to live. So, uh, you know, what are the things that you want and how can you act incrementally to, to make those things happen in your day-to-day -day for the long term? Um, and this is just like little tricks I've had to use. So are there any like tricks that you've had to use beyond like focusing in on the benefit yeah. for you to be able to show up on a daily basis? Oh, a hundred percent. And like I said, listen, when Liz was um, talking about what I wrote in the little description, that like I fall off of this as well, right? Like I, I don't do things perfectly. I don't think I ever will. I, I never have. It's like, it's part of the journey. It's like, you know, I miss a day. And it's like, okay, get back on it. Like you can always start over again. Um, so I think mm -hmm. not going into discipline with this idea of like, if I don't do it, I'm bad. Like it's not pass fail. Exactly. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's, I'm setting this intention because I want to show up for myself. And so like trying to number one, hold myself accountable. I, I can't hold myself accountable. I've learned that. <laughs> <laughs> but mm. sometimes mm. I have to include, uh, you know, you guys, I have to ask my sponsor and say, hey, this is the thing that I'm setting out to do. Can you help keep me accountable? And it's those little like nudges of like, hey, did you do your workout today? And I'm like, no, I'm not really feeling good. And then not only am I like, does somebody have me accountable to remind me to do it the next day, but I get to check in with them then about like, oh, I'm not feeling good. And here's why. Right. Like I get mm. to stay in touch with myself. And so I don't really think that it's like the end goal is like I don't have an expectation of what at the end of 10 weeks it's going to look like. But it's that every day I strive to try to do this thing. Um, <sighs> and and if I do that, then I am being disciplined. Mm. And I think also like, you know, I'll write myself a calendar. And I know it sounds so simple, but like if I can write out my week schedule and I used to do this with meetings so that I don't have to guess every day what I'm doing. Like, you know, if I've got the workout and I know Monday at one, like I know when we're done with this podcast, I'm going to do my workout. Right. And I knew that when I woke up today. So if I already know that and it's already predetermined, like, yes, life comes in and things happen. But like, 
that just sets, sets me up for success here. Yeah. And those are the little tips. Don't put too much pressure on yourself with the word discipline, Bryce. <laughs> you, do you see me in my head? He's like, I don't oh, like yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah. nah, th- thanks for sharing that. I think um, uh, a lot of people will be able to use that. I, I think for me, and for I'm sure people that are listening, like I just need, I need soft. Some people need hard, you know, but I, I need mine to be soft. Uh, so like that feels softer. You know? I need both. Um, yeah. <laughs> That accountability piece, I feel like that is something that I am personally just for for me because I need soft too, but I also really do well with accountability. I had sports growing up too. You know, I feel like when you're like somebody who has been coached, like, and like that's like a thing that you just like are comfortable in, but I never did well with the mean coaches. You know, like I will just like hate, I will just. I mean, even if I look like on the outside, I'm doing well, I'll be dying on the inside, you know? So I'm very careful about who I ask to hold me accountable. Um, very, yeah, that's, that's a big deal to trust someone enough to say, Hey, I, I want you to give me a nudge because I also need you to need to trust you enough to hear me when I say, no, I can't right. do it today. And this is why like, and that's, I mean, yeah, that's why, why I hate people. Absolutely. Right. I feel like when you get to know yourself, you, you, get to like listen to like okay i know that's a safe person i can yeah them to be Mm -hmm. all right well we are at the end of our show we definitely appreciate you coming and and sharing your story so open and honest with us we look forward to having you back at least maybe even for just like a little clip on another episode that is an update on the the journey because we're all invested now Uh, before (laughs) Before we get out of here, uh, final question. If you could go back in time and grab any iteration of Mika and tell her something, g- give her a nugget of wisdom or, or say something, what iteration of Mika would you choose and what would you tell her? Mm-hmm. That's such a good question. I think I would go back to like preteen Mika and hunk her and <laughs> I'm and just say like, you know, you're beautiful and you are right, inherently good and worthy. Mm. Sage advice. Yeah. <laughs> are you able to look in the mirror and kind of say that now? Or like just oh, say yeah. it like to you, from you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Amazing. There was a there was a point in time where I I could not look in the mirror and say, I love you. You're great. And yeah. you're gonna be okay. And I can now. And I believe it. That's the other part. Yeah, that's the big part. Although I gotta tell you, I think there's power in doing it even before you believe it. Like I remember, I feel like a lot of us remember like looking in the mirror during the days of, honestly, like of drink when I was still drinking. And then also even there's days now that I'm just like really in the anxiety and I kind of almost feel like I lose myself and I look in the mirror and like, I can, I look in my eyes and it's like, I'm not there. And it's like this kind of this scary look. It's very more so like during active use, but I feel like I started then, even though it was felt ridiculous. And I wish I had done it more because now looking back, I'm like, man, that person deserved it just as much so if that's where you are today if you're listening that's where you are say it where you believe it (laughs) yeah and we Mm. love you and we believe it we get there together well yeah well we did it and yeah Nika, we're so grateful for you we're so grateful for everyone who's listening and it is just such an honor to be able to do this week after week please hit subscribe so you can join us week after week um we love you and we'll see you next time uh, real quick, leave us a review. If you leave us a review and like tag me, I'll send you a cookie or something like that. Ooh. Like, yeah, yeah. Who knows what kind of cookie it might be? It might be the cookie on your browser, but you know, <laughs> and you might have to hit accept all. Uh, but something's coming your way. Give us a review. If this is if this show has helped you at all, um, that's that it helps other people find us and it helps other people before they listen to an episode know that there's some good stuff in here. So do that, and we'll catch you next time on the Rise Recovery Live podcast. So now you're excited. Bryce, Liz, how do I get involved with the Phoenix? 
Well, my friend, it is super simple. We actually have an app. Head over to the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store or look in the show notes of this podcast, wherever you're listening to or watching this podcast and go download the Phoenix app. The Phoenix app makes it so easy to find classes that are near you or to access our virtual class schedule where you can hop on from the comfort of your home. You can also join our groups and have a conversation with someone from the Phoenix community from anywhere in the world. Please make sure that you join the podcast group where you can connect with Bright and I and other listeners. Everything that you need is in the show notes. You can also head to our website at www.thephoenix.org. And maybe while you're there, you click the volunteer tab and get even more involved.